Good morning, everybody. It's Peter here from AJS, also representing our sister company in New Zealand, GNA Warburton's. And it's my pleasure to once again invite you into a jeweler's workshop somewhere in Australia or even Australasia. And this week we have the pleasure of going to sunny Adelaide and meeting the even sunnier Catherine Grocott. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning, Peter, and good morning to everybody joining us online today. Thanks so much for being here. <laughs> It's great to have you back on board, Catherine. And uh, traditionally, you'd like to do a welcome to country. I do. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I live on the lands of the Ghana people, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging, and recognise that sovereignty has never been ceded and that their spirituality to the land uh, continues to this day. I also, for this one, need to give a bit of a content or trigger warning. Um, we're going to be talking about some difficult and uh, confronting topics today with my jewellery. Uh, so if there are any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples um, listening or watching today, Please be aware that some of what we're going to talk about can be uh, distressing or confronting, uh, and also people who have experienced abuse or violence. Um, yeah, there's going to be some talk about that too. So, because the topic of today, Catherine, is uh, making memories, and we're going to be reflecting on some pieces that you've made and have special significance to you, but they also have special significance uh, in their own right. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to learning all about those. Uh, there's going to be a bit of depth to them by the sounds of it. Yeah, there certainly is. <laughs> uh, yeah. so for those of you who are not aware of my practice, um, I am not a kind of typical contemporary jeweller who makes things for uh an appearance sake or a um, yeah an aesthetic. Rather, my practice is about uh, it's contemporary jewellery with a social justice narrative. Uh, so that means that my work tends to tell a story, and the materials that I use need to help tell that story. Uh, you know, rather than being a, you know, a gold and diamonds jeweller or, a um, you know, I specialise in, uh, like I have a friend who uh, does um, electroformed polystyrene. That is her thing. That's not what I'm about. I'm about uh, kind of telling a story, educating people, and so therefore the materials can be anything and everything as long as they help to contribute and yet yeah, tell the story. Um, so this is where I'm coming from. Uh, you know, you won't often find my pieces with just, you know, nice stones or, you know, pretty designs. Uh, and so hence the, the things that we've uh, decided to show you today. Um, they're a little bit more uh, kind of storytelling, social justice issues, uh, yeah, and quite colourful. <laughs> Yeah. They are. So, well, we've done enough of scaring people, so let's <laughs> let's let's get <laughs> into it, shall we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so I've got a slideshow that's illustrating some of your product and we'll yeah. um <laughs> we'll share our screen and hook into the that. Um just bear with me while I do that. Okay, I think we're on the right page. I can definitely see something. <laughs> Beautiful. Yep. Now, this is a polar bear in Antarctica eating a vanilla <laughs> ice cream. Is that right? <laughs> Have I read rightly into that? <laughs> okay, but that wasn't produced by you. That was mine. Okay, let's move on to your first piece then, Catherine. Let's have a look. Okay. Talk All about right. colourful. 
Yes, very colourful. Uh, these pieces were made for an exhibition called Nine Mapta, uh, which translates to the 9th of March. This was part of the very, very first contemporary jewellery exhibition that ever happened in Russia. 9th of March is the day after the kind of uh, European and sometimes international um, Women's Day on the 8th of March. But for Russian women, they noticed that, you know, the 8th of March, women get, you know, chocolates and flowers, but on the 9th of March, things go back to normal. And so they wanted to uh, start an exhibition that talked about the stories of women uh, around the world. And uh, at the time, I was, um, yeah, about to go on a, or hoping to go on a um, a residency to uh, an Indigenous community. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to go on that residency, but I'd begun doing some research about the experience of Indi Indigenous women in these communities. But the kind of my concern was that I wasn't going to be authentic <laughs> um, if I couldn't actually have, you know, proper face-to-face -face conversations with real women in their real situation. Um, but somebody else, you know, continued to encourage me and said, no, this is still an important um, story to tell. You're just going to have to do it from a slightly different angle. Um, and so realizing that uh, there's a, there's a an author called Chris Budden who wrote a book on um, indigenous people and their experience of racism in Australia and he wrote that indigenous women are doubly oppressed not only are they do they experience discrimination because they are Indigenous, but also because they are women. Um, and so I started to kind of do some research about um, his work and trying to find statistics that might support his claims. Um, so, and also kind of recognising the fact that me as a Second Nations woman, I'm still part of a narrative and, and part of a culture that continues um, to not allow Indigenous women to fully enjoy uh, their lands, their ability to care for it, um, their ability to practice their own uh kind of cultural um, and spiritual practices. So, yeah, kind of recognising that I'm part of the problem. So, yeah, started to do some, some research into, yeah, statistics. Uh, so these are kind of purely and utterly things that I found off the internet. So each... Okay, so I see there's numbers on each of those uh, sets of disks there. So is that where the stats come in? Exactly. Uh, so the statistics are all kind of embossed into that into the aluminium. Um, okay, I was just going to ask, before we discuss the statistics, could you please just tell us what the um, mm. product is made of? Yeah, yeah. So it's, they're aluminium disks, are they? So look, I'll show you under here. Uh these ones are made out of aluminium and I have etched the pieces with the number. So you can see they're slightly indented, but it's kind of difficult to see. And this is why I call them Indigenous Invisibility because so often, one, the statistics aren't known and quite, but often if they are revealed, then often it's in a way 
to shame Indigenous people. Um, you know, the, their kind of their experiences are often hidden from the rest of yeah, yeah, kind of the rest of society. Um, but yeah, if it is released on the media, it's kind of more to yeah, th this kind of idea of shaming uh, Indigenous people. So uh, yeah, these pieces are called Indigenous in Invisibility. The the statistics are kind of deliberately kind of hidden away to accentuate that fact um, of this kind of hiddenness of this information. Um, so there are yeah, three layers of aluminium. Each layer has been powder coated in the different colours and then they are riveted together. So you can see the little, yeah, the four little rivets around the outside. But then I've handmade this cord by twisting sewing thread uh, and making it into a cord. And then the middle disc actually has a little hook cut out of it that the um, that the cord can then latch onto and then be secured inside so it can't be, like, pulled out or anything. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the cord and then the neck piece is actually completely enclosed inside, inside the discs. So with if people purchased one, they would then get a a matching, oh that's the that's the symbol of the exhibition it was, nine, the 9th of March project. Um, they would get one of these kind of little envelopes and that would reveal what the number meant. So for this yellow one, you can open it up. And again, it's kind of written in the same oh, kind of pink colour. Okay. So again, yeah. it's a little bit hidden, a little bit difficult to, you know, kind of find. You've really got uh, to know, it, want to know what the uh, meaning is. So. That's right, yeah. Mm. So this one is that non-Indigenous people in 2016 were 1.4 times more likely than Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be employed. Um, so this is kind of... Yeah, just one of the one of the examples. Uh, other ones of the statistics will talk about uh, things like the the rates of uh, imprisonment of Indigenous women. So that they're twenty one point two times more likely to be imprisoned than non Aboriginal women. Sadly. In Western Australia, the most common reason that women are imprisoned is for not paying parking fines. Yeah. And no, you, you just go, no white woman would be imprisoned for mm. that. <laughs> um, it just wouldn't happen. Um, yeah. And again, most often <laughs> that is because they are trying to get an elderly or frail or um, sick family member to a healthcare centre and there's no adequate parking at those places that allows the sick person easy access. So they're parking in places just to help their um you know, a family member get to the medical centre um, and they, they're getting... Penalised for it, yeah. They're getting penalised to the yeah. point of imprisonment. Um, but, yeah, that, that would not happen. Uh, you know, it, yeah, that, that just would not happen <laughs> to a, a white woman. Um, so there's other statistics about um, being the victims of homicide the victims of um, violent assault, uh, domestic, um, yeah, domestic violence, their their lower comparable rates of income compared to their white counterparts. Mm. Um, 
it's a bit of a pity. I mean, it's such an oxymoron, isn't it? Because you've got things of such beauty, uh, you're revealing things that are quite sad mm -hmm. and ugly. Yeah. And the I chose the the colours and the kind of the dots as this kind of respectful homage to the powerful dot paintings that many Indigenous women, uh, you know, paint, uh, if, depending on their um, particular yeah, culture. Yeah. I was wondering why the disc and now that makes perfect sense because uh, those dot paintings are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, they certainly are. So, uh, Catherine, you've you've um, matched the the cord beautifully to the powder coating. Can mm -hmm. you tell us about uh, one the process with the powder coating? How many do you have to get powder coated um, in a in a run, and how do you go about matching that colour? Uh, we have the most wonderful <laughs> powder coater here in uh, Adelaide. Uh, his name's Les from uh, Central Powder Coaters, and he has this wonderful wall of um, uh, what I, um, like swatches. Sw yes, like they're, they're tin cans. They're like, you know, aluminium cans that he has um, powder coated, so you can choose your colours from that. Right. So basically what I did was try to um, kind of choose colours that co represented the rainbow. Um, so that there would be kind of this uh, inclusive nature of it. Um, but then once, oh, and because he's a fantastic powder coater and he has supported contemporary jewellers uh, in Adelaide for oh, well over a decade now, probably close to two decades, <laughs> um, he does things like only powder coating three things for you um so these were all i got done um i did not have to have a minimum number uh with him which was brilliant then i took all of those off to spotlight and sat in front of their gutterman thread counter and matched the uh -huh. matched the sewing threads and bought yeah, bought them, the ones that matched the best to the powder coating. So the powder coating came first because there's less okay. of a cover choice and yep. then the thread choice came as a result of the the colours that I chose. And then so, you had your envelopes. So surely you had to compromise on the envelopes. <laughs> well, they're, yeah, I don't they know. Look, if you... They look pretty good. Oh, yeah. The, I, I have a... Uh, one, two, three, four, five. I do have six boxes of cardstock just behind me over here. <laughs> oh, so you had to buy a few more of those. Um, no, no, no. All of that, that cardstock I already had. <laughs> I didn't oh, have okay. to get any more. Oh, <laughs> so, that's yeah. cardstock. So have you physically yep. made those envelopes? I've made those, yes. Wow. Yes. I've made the envelopes, the cards. I've printed them all out myself. So, yes, I have a... I have a little machine that, uh, yeah, I can make any size envelopes. Um, so, yeah, my paper crafting comes into this one. <laughs> I don't and then when you embossed that, the, the card that's inside, how mm -hmm. did you do that? Oh, that's all printed on a computer. So okay. that, that one is actually um, I know what the – like the colour coding is for printing on my printer for every colour cardstock that okay. I have. Right, so you've <laughs> yeah, used a colour yeah, printer and you've printed in essentially the same colour as the card. Exactly, yep. Wow. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. the a uh, lot of coordination. I, I, I do like my things to match. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the uh, that's the kind of... The story of of those ones. Any other questions? Have well, what I'll do this? is I'll just stop sharing so I can see if there's any comments or questions from anybody. And uh, just bear with me a second. So I'll just highlight you.
Okay, so if anyone does have any comments or questions, uh, please let us know what you thought of that piece of Catherine's. I think the um, kind of in that particular series, I kind of had the, you know, the, the seven um, kind of rainbow colours and they, they had such um, kind of anger-inducing statistics in that, you know, I hate the thought that Indigenous women do not have the same opportunities um, often and do not experience the same safety or the same rates of pay uh, that I enjoy. Um, but I did find one statistic that was quite encouraging, and this was that, and so I put this on a silver one um, as kind of a symbolic way of going, but Indigenous women are incredibly strong and incredibly resilient. Uh, so 12% of 18 to 24-year-old Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander females attend a university or other tertiary institution and females are more likely than males to attend a university or other tertiary institution. So that kind of uh, awareness that Aboriginal women aren't sitting back and just taking these stats, they're, mm. they're making... positive. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're engaging in activities that help strengthen themselves, their communities, their children, um, their families. So, yeah, there is the statistics aren't the end of the story. Um, so, yeah, while that is part of the narrative at the moment, my hope and dream is that they won't stay that way, that there'll be a no, change. No, indeed, which is everyone's hope. Shall we move yeah. on to our next piece then, uh, yeah. Catherine? Yeah. Okay, let's see if I can just share our screen again. Now, this one is going to be a little bit harder for me to show live. <laughs> yeah, just, and you will see uh, why. Okay, so we're there. Yeah. So here comes our next one now. Wow, look at that. Yep. So this one is called Counting Dead Women. Um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> you, did, you did give us a warning, yes. Uh, yes. Mm. Uh, this piece started uh, in 2020 when on February the 19th, Hannah Clark uh and her three children yep. killed by her estranged husband a footballer mm. who many of you might remember this one uh because it was quite it was in the news a lot yeah she was she and her children were set on fire inside their car and the four of them died and at the time um, I was aware of the narrative that talked about one woman per week in Australia is killed by their their partner or ex-partner, pa intimate partner or ex-intimate partner. Um, and I think that particular incident kind of, set me on a journey of kind of going, why? Like, why does this happen? How can this be possible? Yeah, what kind of causes this? Uh, so I started off with this was made for an exhibition called Surface, which was a jam factory exhibition of my cohort, my year um, of associates, and we were exploring um ways of giving, ways of treating surface. Um, and so this piece is all enamelled. Uh, this is a, a jewellery technique where uh, 
usually in jewellery it's either copper or silver and you put a fine glass powder onto the surface and you can either heat it up in a kiln or what I use was a torch. Uh, you heat it up so that the glass melts and becomes this glossy, shiny, colourful um, kind of surface. Uh, at the time of the exhibition, Hannah was the eighth woman to have been killed that year, so that you know, nineteenth of February. Um, so we were we were right on track at that point for one woman per week being killed. Um, so by the time of the exhibition, there were nine, I think, or maybe twelve. No, it might be nine. But then, in my kind of naive brain. I was like, you know, hopefully I won't have to make any more. But as the year went on, more women were being killed. And the, the way that I could find this information out was because there's a group called Destroy the Joint and they do a project called the Counting Dead Women Project where they list, um, yeah, on a website, Facebook kind of page, they list every murder of Australian women each year. So as the year went on, they kept listing more women and I was like, oh, my goodness, I, I can't stop at the first nine. I need keep going. <laughs> um, mm. It sounds sick, but um, I suppose it, it needs to be highlighted because it's a huge issue in society, isn't it? And the right. only way we'll do something about it is if we highlight it. Yeah. And, and this, again, Catherine, such a beautiful piece representing such uh, ugliness in our society. So, yeah. yeah. And this is the the kind of the real struggle that I had where I wanted to highlight the fact that every single one of those women were beautiful and precious and unique and individuals. So every single one of them, I mean, I've, I've cut out the shape of a woman, um, mm. but every single one is enameled in different colours. So no two are the same. And having their lives cut short kind of means that the rest of the world, the rest of us, miss out on their beautiful, unique contribution to society, to life, to their families. Um, and... As the year went on and I'm adding more and more women, um, I remember getting to, it was actually the following year, because uh, this ended up being exhibited like another few times as kind of more um, exhibitions came up that this story suited, plus the fact that it kept growing. Um, but towards, it was probably part way through the following year, I thought, I thought I'd gotten to the end, that all of the women had been counted. And I can remember kind of enamelling the last one, going into my studio and threading them all on and then bursting into tears. And that kind of having read every single one of their stories and who had killed them and how they had died and the just the kind of horror of it, 
I kind of kept it together mm. for the year. And then when I thought that it finished, it was like the floodgates opened and, you know, one of the one of the people at Jam, yeah, was wonderful and, yeah, kind of cried on their shoulder and, yeah, hugged and, but even then realising that my grief could not compare in any way, shape or form to the parents who had lost their daughter or the children who'd lost their mother or mm. the siblings who'd lost their sister because of mostly mindless violence that had to do with most of them, coercive control and attitudes of women belonging to men um, and that they don't have the, you know, the right or the uh, ability to do things like leave an abusive relationship. Um, so as I did the research, I did kind of discover that it's not one woman per week are being killed by their partner or ex-partner. That's not actually accurate. Uh, there is definitely more than one woman being killed each week, but who's doing the killing is a little bit more complex than that. So in Australia, in that particular year, in 2020, 35% of the murders were committed by their intimate partner, current or ex. The next biggest group, 21%, was actually a family member and it was most likely going to be a father or a brother. Um, the next biggest group, 16%, were known males, and these were most likely going to be work colleagues or people that the woman knew through, you know, clubs or social activities or sporting groups or things like that. The next biggest group this year was of 8% was actually women. Uh, mm. so yeah. There was 5% that were unknown, but given the statistics, they are most likely going to be male. And then there was one case which constituted 2% that was an unknown male and female um, uh, who killed a woman. Um, so, yeah, the that kind of narrative that it's always the partner's fault <laughs> is not quite right, but absolutely a family member is by far your biggest um, and most dangerous um, unit with well over 50% of the perpetrators. So, yeah, whether that's spouse, ex, dad, father, brother, the family <laughs> is actually the most dangerous place for a woman. Um, yeah. And again, So, Catherine, just on the piece itself, um, mm -hmm. and thank you for all that explanation. So you said that these uh, women here were threaded on. Is, what's the story there? Yeah, this is threaded onto neoprene. Um, so let me now. This is where I'm sorry I won't be able to show you it in its kind of form. But this is the piece here. Now, yep. the neoprene three mil, kind of very flexible. Uh, 
And you'll notice that I haven't um, finished it in that it's got no findings on the end um, because it, it's kind of symbolic of the fact that, sadly, these were happening, the killings were happening before I started the project. They were happening in the years before 2020. And sadly, they continued afterwards. Those the stats of one woman per week haven't changed um, in the years since. So I haven't been able to put findings on them because often, well, sorry, not often, but years later things can come to light uh, to the point where in May of 2022, so this is two years later, I had to put on another five women because their stories had only just been released to the public. Um, so, yeah, the neoprene kind of serves as a way of um, allowing me to continue the project if it's needed. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's definitely a hard project to work on for a year. Um, well, and, mm. and actually, it, it's been multiple years. It ended up being two and a half years working on it as, yeah, there were more people added during 2021 and 2022. Um, at this point, the numbers have remained stable at 62 women killed in 2020. Yeah. How's everybody right. feeling? <laughs> We're a bit depressed at the minute, Catherine. <laughs> And um, at the beginning, this is going to be tough. <laughs> is the next is the next piece going to be any better? Uh, the next one is more universal uh, and affects the entire planet. Oh, okay. How are, people, how are people feeling? Do do we go on or do we do we stop there and we can? We can look at another one another time when people may have time to recover. Um, what, what, what yeah. are your thoughts? <laughs> I'm actually thinking that might be enough gloom and doom in one one session. Yeah. 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 Um, but, I mean, it's there's stories that need to be told mm. and art is a, a great way to do that. And it's amazing that you can create things of such beauty that represent, as I said before, such ugliness. Yeah. yeah, and I think, I mean, certainly with these two cases, the, the fact that, yeah, Indigenous women, non-Indigenous women, they are such incredibly beautiful, powerful, strong, resilient, creative, um, you know, wonderful people that need to be celebrated. Um and as such, kind of acknowledging their, their um, yeah, their strength, their uniqueness, um, yeah, d despite the the difficulty of what's kind of I'm trying to educate about. The flip side is still wanting to. Encourage and mm. show the potential. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, thank yeah. you, everybody, for your willingness to journey with us on a difficult, difficult conversation. Um, mm. Two very hard subjects um, that, yes, do need highlighting, um, and. I hope in kind of in this kind of artistic and wearable way uh, some of those issues 
can get highlighted and um, brought into the light rather than being yeah, hidden away. Yeah. Mm. So tell me, Catherine, do you have any art that represents uh, something a bit more cheery in it? <laughs> oh, for the future. Um, I'm talking about for the future. No. <laughs> I do have a commission. And here I was saying, you know, I'm not a stone and, you know, metal person. I have a commission that's, yeah, coming up that is a fantastic, stunning 23.25 carat blue topaz, absolutely amazing, that I am putting into a rivet ring for a lovely gentleman here in um, in Adelaide. Uh, yeah, and he he loves beautiful gemstones and he wanted what he considered a kind of a pretty stone uh, kind of masculinized and um yeah so he's asked me to put it into a one of my rivet rings um so that yeah it's more wearable for a gentleman uh so yeah that's coming up soon well perhaps um, we can share that story in a, a future episode hey that sounds great <laughs> <laughs> So we'll finish it there on that uh, positive note. and uh, But it's always a positive thing to see you, Catherine. So thank you so much for sharing and uh, all the work you've um, put into today's presentation. And uh, we hope that people out there have got something out of it. I mean, part of the idea behind this is just to share, uh, you know, about people's art and hopefully give other people inspiration as to where they could take their own art. Yeah. And if anybody, you know, if you need to kind of talk about this or anything, yeah, comment and I can respond um, or go to a trusted friend, lifeline, um, yeah, talk to a family member. Um, but, yeah, definitely make sure that you are um, yeah. But just to clarify, Lifeline doesn't give uh, advice in jewellery making, though, does it? No, no. No, no. <laughs> so for that, just uh, comment to Catherine and she'll help you out. <laughs> thank okay, you. Okay, Catherine. No worries. Well, we'll look forward yeah, to seeing you thank next time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Much appreciated.